When John Kerry became Secretary of State, his seat in the U.S. Senate became vacant. Massachusetts Governor Deval Patrick appointed a lawyer named Mo Cowan uh, to essentially just be a placeholder for that seat until there could be a Massachusetts election to fill it permanently. Mr. Cowan agreed he, would, he himself would not run to hold on to that Senate seat, and he didn't. Eventually, there was a special election to fill the seat full-time, and Massachusetts voters chose Ed Markey to go to the Senate. But when Mr. Mo Cowan was sworn into the Senate to hold that seat for just a few months, something historic happened. For a, a hot minute, for an overlap of only about 20 weeks, while Mo Cowan was there, for the first time in U.S. history, there were two black people in the United States Senate. Congressman Tim Scott of South Carolina was also appointed to a Senate seat to fill a vacancy. He got his seat at the very beginning of the year. And then when Mo Cowan got there in February, their overlap in the Senate was historic. We had never before had two African-Americans simultaneously serving in the United States and in the United States Senate. And, and since Mo Cowan is gone now, we are no longer in that situation. Aside from that brief overlap of those two appointed senators, Every single one of the few African Americans who have ever served in the United States Senate, every single one of them has served there alone, even back during Reconstruction. The only African American woman to have ever served in the Senate is Carol Mosley Braun, the senator from Illinois. She served in the 1990s. Carol Mosley Braun remains the only black woman to have ever served in the Senate, and she was the only black senator of either gender in the Senate. One August day back in 1993, so 10 years ago, when she stepped onto the senator's only elevator in the U.S. Capitol. She was on the senator's elevator already when a senator from North Carolina named Jesse Helms stepped on to join her on that elevator. Senator Orrin Hatch was also on the elevator with the two of them. And Jesse Helms stepped onto that elevator. He looked at Senator Carol Mosley Braun, the only African-American in the Senate. He looked her in the face and started to sing Dixie, Dixie, the Confederate anthem. Senator Mosley Braun told the story publicly the next day, then she confirmed it to the Los Angeles Times, along with her press secretary who saw it happen. Senator Carol Mosley Braun said, quote, he saw me standing there and he started to sing, I wish I was in the land of cotton. And then he looked at Senator Hatch and he said, I'm going to make her cry. I'm going to sing Dixie until she cries. She's the only African-American in the Senate at that time. Jesse Helms got his start in politics in 1950 in North Carolina uh, when his candidate, Willis Smith, was running against Frank Porter Graham, who was the former president of UNC, uh, the University of North Carolina. Jesse Helms said that UNC stood for the University of Negroes and Communists. In that campaign, the Helms side ran an ad that said, white people, wake up before it is too late. Do you want Negroes working beside you, your wife and your daughters? In your mills and factories, Frank Graham favors mixing of the races. They also made up campaign literature in that campaign saying that Frank Graham's wife once danced with a black man. Jesse Helms' candidate won that race with tactics like those. And that is how Jesse Helms got his first job in Washington, D.C. And once he was there, once he himself was in the United States Senate, he led a one-man, 16-day filibuster there against there being a holiday to honor Martin Luther King Jr., he threatened another filibuster in the mid-80s to protect the apartheid regime in South Africa from U.S.-imposed sanctions. When he ran for re-election in 1990, Jesse Helms ran an ad that is one of the most famous American political ads of all time. It's called the White Hands ad. And the narrator says, you were the best qualified, but they had to give it to a minority. Vote for Jesse Helms. It was basically explicit. Vote for the white man to keep white jobs for white people. When Jesse Helms retired from the Senate, David Broder at the Washington Post wrote that he was, quote, the last prominent, unabashed, white, racist politician in this country. When he finally died in 2008, his Los Angeles Times obituary noted that unlike other symbols of segregation, such as Alabama Governor George Wallace and South Carolina Senator Strom Thurmond, who eventually recanted their opposition to racial integration, Jesse Helms held firm until his death. That whole story of the Republican Party capturing the white vote in the South by becoming the party of modern white racism, saying, vote Republican white people will protect you from the black people, that is not a made up story. And it was not a subtle thing. And Jesse Helms whistling Dixie in Carol Mosley Braun's face, saying he wanted to make her cry as the only black person in the U.S. Senate, 
Jesse Helms is the personification of that and always has been. Never repented, never apologized. It was the whole point of his politics. Jesse Helms. Now watch this. There's another story I heard of Jesse Helms when he first ran. That he opened the mail and out fell a check for $5,000 from John Wayne. So he spent some time trying to track down. It's not easy to figure out how do you call John Wayne, but, but he managed to figure out how to do so. And he placed the call, and, and the Duke answered the phone. And, 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 and apparently Jesse Helms said, you know, Mr. Wayne, this, this, this is Jesse Helms. Um, I, I just wanted to thank you for your tremendous support in this race. Apparently John Wayne said, who? And he said, well, well Jesse Helms, I'm, I'm, I'm running for Senate in, Nor in North Carolina. And apparently Wayne said, oh, yeah, you're that guy saying all those crazy things. We need a hundred more like you. <laughs> the willingness to say all those crazy things is a rare, rare characteristic in this town. And you know what? It's every bit as true now as it was then. We need a hundred more like Jesse Helms in the U.S. Senate. Whistling Dixie in Carol Mosley Braun's face in the Senate elevator. We need a hundred more Jesse Helmses. That's what Ted Cruz thinks would be good for America. What happens next in this situation? You needed that job and you were the best qualified but they had to give it to a minority because of a racial quota. Is that really fair? Harvey Gantt says it is. Gantt supports Ted Kennedy's racial quota law that makes the color of your skin more important than your qualifications. You'll vote on this issue next Tuesday. For racial quotas, Harvey Gantt. Against racial quotas, Jesse Helms. You know what? It's every bit as true now as it was then. We need a hundred more like Jesse Helms in the U.S. Senate. So what you saw there was the racist white hands ad from Jesse Helms' 1990 Senate campaign against his African-American challenger, Harvey Gantt. That was kind of par for the course Jesse Helms politics. That's what he was. Senator Ted Cruz of Texas says today that the Senate needs a hundred more senators just like that. Joining us now is Steve Kornacki. He's the host of Up with Steve Kornacki, which airs weekends at 8 a.m. Eastern. He's also a senior writer at Salon. Steve, thanks for being here. You're welcome. Um, Trent Lott lost his job uh, in the Republican leadership in the Senate when he praised Strom Thurmond and said that he wished he had, that Strom Thurmond had won the presidency when he ran as a segregationist. Is Jesse Helms kind of the same cuddle of fish? Or Ted Cruz. No, Jesse Helms. Or, no, I thought you meant for that. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah, well, no, exactly. Yeah. They're, both, they're both sort of symbols of the evolution of, you know, white conservatism and the modern Republican Party. Mm -hmm. And it was Strom Thurmond was a Democrat, you know, for most of it, for a lot of his life, left the party to run the Dixiecrat in 1948, then left the party for good when Barry Goldwater was nominated by the Republicans in 1964. And I think it was in 1970 that Jesse Helms uh, left the Democratic Party and joined the Republican Party. And they symbolized that sort of very sort of racialized transformation of politics in the South. And and the modern Republican Party in the South. They're, they're both very similar in that way. Where they're different, I think, is that Strom Thurmond, and I'm going to try to say this in a way that's not giving him too much credit, but Strom Thurmond did evolve a bit yeah. in the course of his career. And he didn't lean on, on, on racially polarizing rhetoric for, you know, toward the end of his career. He's still a very conservative Republican in all of these things. Jesse Helms never backed away from it till the very end. He won, won his last re-election campaign in 1996. And the other thing is, you know, and, and he kept winning, too. That's, that's the other sort of disturbing thing. 1996 wasn't that long ago. Yeah. And he retired in 2002. Um, I have a feeling if he'd run in 2002, he probably still would have won that year. So North Carolina is changing a lot, but it wasn't that long ago that a guy like Jesse Helms was very electable there. That said, and I think that's right, that Strom Thurmond actually ended up being less electrifying as a racial sort of lightning rod than Jesse Helms was. But citing Strom Thurmond's past and approving of it and saying, I wish we'd had more of that, was enough to cost Trent Lott a big chunk of his career 
Ted, is Ted Cruz safe in complimenting Jesse Helms in the same well, way? Well, he's, he's safe in the sense that what Trent Lott had, the position he had, the title he had, and sort of the prestige he had in 2002 as the Senate Republican leader, he served at, you know, sort of the pleasure of his fellow Republicans in yes. the Senate, at the pleasure of the Republican establishment. So the Republican establishment could take that away from him if they decided he was sort of a public liability for them. And that's what they did. The Bush White House at the time basically led this coup in the Senate, and they got behind Bill Frist from Tennessee, and they basically orchestrated a coup where Bill, Bill Frist replaced Trent lot as the Republican leader. You know, what Ted Cruz is and how Ted Cruz defines himself politically is he's away from the establishment. You know, he's the one who stands out there and says, the establishment, they're a bunch of squishes. I'm the true conservative. I'm the purist. You know, I'm the guy who defines what conservatism really is. So the problem for the Republican establishment, at least from a PR standpoint, is what can they take away from Ted Cruz? And if they go after Ted Cruz on something like this, if they say, this is terrible, this is shameful, then he points at them and he says, see, it's the squishes being squishes again. Right. And within Republican world, it, it enhances his stature. Do, would the Republican establishment now, though, even have that same instinct of being embarrassed by these comments in the same way they were embarrassed by Trent Lott? I mean, part of the reason that the establishment wanted to get rid of Trent Lott, uh, it may, there may have been other stuff under the, uh, under the surface, but once you've said you wish a segregationist had been elected president, that's bad for the Republican brand. Ted Cruz, especially if he's going to run for president, he's out there saying, yeah, we needed 100 more Jesse Helmses. I mean, Jesse Helms was an overt racist throughout his career and unrepentant. We don't even need to get to what he said about AIDS and gay people and all the rest of it. I mean, is there an instinct in the Republican Party establishment now, whether or not they can do anything about it, that that might be embarrassing, that that might be a bad position for somebody in a high profile position in the party to hold? I think there, I think there are a couple possibilities. And, and the Trent Lott story get, gets to one of them, I think, which is that, again, they saw the, the PR liability of Trent Lott in yeah. 2002. But I think the real attitude among Republicans who served with them, the overwhelming attitude among them was, He's getting a raw deal here. We got to do this. We got to throw him overboard, mm. but he doesn't really deserve it. And the, and the giveaway for that is that four years later, after the 2006 midterms, the Republicans had some openings in leadership again, and Trent Lott ran for whip on the Republican side, and he was elected. He beat right. Lamar Alexander for that they position, and he retired. So he retired as the whip. So is that the attitude? Uh, are they embarrassed, but they're afraid to say anything because Ted Cruz right now, you know, sort of is the pulse of the base of the party. So are there Republicans who are embarrassed, but they realize if I speak up, I'm going to pay a political price for that. I he doesn't they don't need to punish him overtly at all. I'm waiting to hear if any Republicans are embarrassed by that or if any Republicans want to step up and say, no, actually, there shouldn't be 100 Jesse Helms is here. Uh, that has not happened yet. That has not been the reaction. I think that's you. Wait for the memoirs after they retire. Then, oh, you, then you read about it, you know. It's crazy making. Steve Kornacki, host of MSNBC's Weekend Morning Show, up with Steve Kornacki. You are exactly the man I wanted to talk to about this because I know you remember it all hook, line and sinker. Thanks, Steve. Thanks. We'll be right back.